We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good morning. Let's try this again. Uh, thank you for joining us today at the main session on economic and social inclusion and human rights. My name is Courtney Raj. I am a MAG member and co-chair of the Dynamic Coalition on Sustainability of Journalism in the News Media. I'm delighted to be here moderating this important main session on one of the most important topics in internet governance, as evidenced by the fact that uh, the most workshop proposals, 34%, were actually submitted on this topic, which I think underscores the importance and the centrality of economic rights, social inclusion, and human rights to internet governance. I'm gonna spend a few minutes laying out the stage because we've had a new approach this year at the IGF to hold preparatory phases to really bring us to some outcome-oriented um, initiatives here at the IGF. And so I'll review kind of what happened in the preparatory phase, and then we're going to get into a discussion with our panelists who are really a stellar group of people whose expertise is deep and wide. We will be joined by Sarah Kidden, technologist and researcher at the Mozilla Foundation, by Jeff, sorry, by Jess Kropisinski, associate professor at Cincinnati University, by Steve Crown, vice president and deputy general counsel at Microsoft, and Scott Campbell, senior human rights and technology officer from the UN Office of the Commissioner for Human Rights. But before we get to these panelists who are joining us from around the world in this hybrid session, I wanna talk about First of all, some of the trends and opportunities and risks, which is where we'll focus the first part of this conversation, and then some possible governance strategies to address these trends. And I want to invite everyone who is in the audience here in Poland, as well as everyone who's joining online, to actively participate. There is somebody with a microphone, and if you're interested in, in making a comment or asking a question, we welcome that. This is your IGF. Similarly, online, I'm joined by fellow MAG member um, Afia here, who has done so much to bring this panel together. She'll be moderating the, the chat online, so we really welcome this opportunity to have an inclusive discussion. But first, let me lay out a little bit of the sense of what we want to get at today, because we know that political and civil rights have occupied a central role in the public discourse, especially with the rise of COVID-19, new forms of data collection and analysis, which have given rise to new opportunities to address the economic and social challenges posed by the pandemic, but also concerns about excessive surveillance activities by state actors and potential human rights abuses by private and state actors. One of the things that came out clearly in the preparatory phase was that we talk a lot about human rights, mainly as political and civil rights, but that cultural and socioeconomic rights are very important as well, and that they hold the potential to use data for promoting the common good. And so although these are often implicitly addressed, they're not necessarily as discursively prominent. So I'm gonna try to mitigate that today. Um, as we think about some of the issues around state actors and private companies and this issue around mass surveillance and manipulation of individual behavior through tracing apps, we've seen the conversation evolve from what can tech do to what are its implications and a recognition that with appropriate safeguards, there are great economic and health benefits that can come from human rights-centered use of data and tracing apps, that we need to center the right to privacy, freedom of expression, and information because there is truly a growing movement that is advocating for the respect of human rights in the digital sphere. The other thing that came out clearly from this preparatory phase is that knowledge is power and it is vital for the promotion of human rights and that we need to protect the ability to use technology, the internet, and our digital businesses and apps to create 
and spread knowledge, um, but that we also need to make sure that the business practices and the state laws and regulations that are being impl implemented are also respecting and, and enhancing that knowledge without fear. So I want to talk, before we kind of get into governance strategies, we're gonna discuss for the first couple of minutes um, some of the key questions, uh, and I'd like to invite first the, each speaker to make remarks of about four minutes to talk about what you see as the primary trends that are most important um, in terms of economic and social inclusion and human rights, especially what is new, what we've seen over the past year, um, and what you're thinking about most of all from your perch. So first I'd like to invite Sarah Kitten, from the Mozilla Foundation. Please, go ahead. The floor is yours. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to join my colleagues in this session. So to respond to the question about trends, I want to say something that we've been discussing for the last two years, that digital inequalities have actually always existed. Uh, but because of COVID-19, now they've been brought to the fore. Um, and different countries and communities have responded in different ways. So on the one hand, you had the group that responded very quickly and took everything online. People started to work online, shop online, online businesses and everything online. But there was another group that was completely cut off and they're not cut off from luxury, they're cut off from basics, education, healthcare, and so on. And it's really sad that two years on, almost three years, some people are still cut off. For example, in Uganda right now, schools are still closed. You, you won't believe it, but schools are still closed and there are children who have not attended school for the last two years. So this is really sad that you have people moving on and you have people in places where they have to compete with uh, people who have continued with life uh, as usual. Interestingly though, while all this was happening, we also saw other things come up. We have seen a lot of talk about the metaverse, uh, which actually has been around for about 20 years or more. Uh, there's a nice fiction, science fiction book by uh, Neil Stevenson that beautifully talks about the metaverse. I would highly recommend that you read that book. It's called Snow Crash. So we, we've seen uh, games, online games. There's a game called Second Life and games like that are raising over $1 billion in revenue. We have seen people buying virtual homes, apparently your avatar online also needs a home. And these homes are in the millions of dollars. We've seen virtual fashion shows from Gucci, uh, I think it was called Gucci Garden or something like this. And people are buying virtual bags for $4,000, $5,000, $6,000. Uh, like all these things are happening. And my worry is that if this is the reality we are choosing to live, what does it mean for people without access to basic services? Um, how can a creative in a developing part of the world where connectivity gets problematic sometimes compete with other counterparts who, you know, have access to all these services? Is this even a priority? right now. There are just so many questions that I'm asking myself. But with that said, we still have an opportunity to change things right now. Uh, also, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have a use case. Not that we needed one, but at least now we have evidence, we have research, we have numbers and statistics that we can use to advocate and show how deep and uh, harming these digital inequalities can be for everyday people. And it just shows that if we don't address them, we are not only not respecting human rights, but we run the risk of... Uh, advancing in technology, and yet we've not even solved the problems that we have right now. Um, and also, we run another risk of having technologies that don't serve everyone. And finally, uh, me being optimistic, I believe this is also an opportunity for us to look back, reflect, evaluate, and see what's missing, where we went wrong, and what we can do better. I'll stop here for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. You know, the, the, the distinction between the luxury goods and the very basic uh, goods that have really, I, I think a lot of us knew that was happening, but the pandemic, as you rightly note, has just exemplified that differential and that basic connectivity is at the root of enjoying economic and social rights. Um, I want to turn now to um, Steve Crown, who is the Vice President and Deputy General Counsel at Microsoft, um, one of the world's uh, most 
I think, biggest and, and wealthiest uh, technology platforms that works across a lot of different types of businesses. Um, what have you seen in terms of the rising significance of these issues and, and the public awareness and the key trends that have emerged um, along with risks since the pandemic? Right. Um, well, thank you, Courtney. Uh, it's a real delight to participate in this. I'd planned to be in person and my trip fell through um, literally in the last week to 10 days. Um, but let me start by just noting something pretty obvious. I'm coming at it from my perspective inside a major technology company. And as Courtney noted, it's important to kind of lay the stage and understand um, where we're situated and, and a little bit about how we got here. And I start with, from the uh, perspective that some of this is not new. A lot of it is not, in fact, new. It's just we're focusing on it in a different way. Um, you know, the major technology companies and the global internet, we for a long time have been looking and engaging the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Um, the Office of Human Rights in the UN, where Scott is, uh, there's an ongoing dialogue with the big technology companies on uh, digital uh, applying the UN guiding principles to technological challenges uh, with the global internet. So in some ways, this is a continuation, but I do think we've seen a new focus and I actually, up level it a bit. I think there's a discussion happening that's not always explicit, which is really more about the social contract, the, the idea why do we have businesses who um, are operating the way they do and how should they operate? Why do companies exist? And should they be allowed to exist if we see some of the harms that we actually uh, are finding out there? Now, I take the position that it's actually to our uh, collective benefit that we do have private companies engaging in the way that we do. But I love uh, one of the ways of framing this, you know, this notion of why do companies exist? Professor Colin Meyer up at uh, Oxford University at the Said School, uh, he has uh, proposed a, a corporation's purpose. And I do wanna keep it at this high level before diving into what we're, we're actually doing and, and how we approach this. But a corporation's purpose is to provide profitable solutions to problems of people and planet. It really is this notion of companies are doing it with a, we should not uh, be confused, they're doing it for profit uh, in, a, in a way that tries to find economic efficiencies and find ways to bring technologies more effectively forward. But it, it, it must be about solving problems. And these are problems that are facing people and they're problems facing the planet, which is why we as Microsoft and other companies are so engaged in technology to address global warming. But how should we understand today's concern with social and economic inclusion? I think we're not going to understand the exact things that brought us from where we were pre-COVID to COVID. We can point to COVID, but I don't think that really does a lot to advance our understanding. I think it's most valuable to look at the dynamics that we're seeing, citizens' expectations that are now clearer. Uh, we need, and that's the value of IGF in part is making explicit these expectations, but then we need thoughtful engagement by uh, companies and by all participants in the ecosystem. So that's um, you know NGOs, human right defenders, making sure that we get the right uh, questions asked and we get the right panoply, the range of po possible solutions actually identified, not leaving that solely to companies. We need much more uh, multi-stakeholder dialogue happening there. So a few of the things that I, th I would uh, highlight in these opening comments are we're clearly in a world in which there is a renewed focus. It's been there before, but I think it's a sharper focus on inclusive social and economic development and the role of technology companies and other uh, corporations, it could be pharmaceuticals, in providing meaningful access to the benefits that uh, companies can bring. And this has to happen on every continent in every country. It has to happen in every community, urban and rural. We see this with the internet, especially the, the rural urban divide, the global north, global south. Meaningful access to technology uh, is a major challenge for us. And it has to be reaching into every business, small and large, and every person, including the billion plus people on the planet with disabilities. Um, there's a strong piece now that understanding this is our chance to refocus 
uh, for a sustainable future, uh, moving from carbon neutrality to carbon negative, the idea of removing carbon, not just slowing the uh, continued uh, deployment of, of carbon into the environment. And then there's um, a big piece of responding to COVID. And the pharmaceutical companies, of course, have theirs. Technology companies have contributed uh, massive amounts of computer uh, research, uh, computer resources to uh, allow global uh, engagement and collaborations. But I'd also point out uh, the incredible need we now see for addressing education in the time of COVID. Uh, you know, kids who have not been at school, they've not been socialized uh, the way they have. Uh, we at Microsoft are actively engaged in working with nonprofits to see how we can improve digital learning. And a, a as in this one, uh, the, the notion of hybrid experiences to make sure that we're not leaving uh, the youngest generation behind as we manage our way through the COVID uh, challenges. But I'll, I'll stop by noting this notion of multi-stakeholder, deeper collaboration and discussion that includes governments and includes companies, but it especially includes those who can represent the voice of those who need their perspective understood and addressed. Uh, we at Microsoft refer to human-centered activities. Everything we do, we make sure in the company, it starts from this notion of how does this address human need? What problem are we solving? And do we have human beings at the forefront as opposed to uh, we also need to address these issues of accessibility? Um, and then it's that notion of rights respecting solutions. Uh, so we do believe there's going to be a continuing role for technology companies to leverage technology, but it must be uh, directed at empowering people and providing meaningful accept. Uh, uh, deeply desired solutions. I'll stop there, but I look forward to the conversation with the panel Thank and you. with the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, you raised many critical issues and, and really touched on so many of the diverse topics that do fall under this category. And it was it's refreshing to hear you refer to human-centered activities, to human-centered design. We often talk about internet users, but let's be clear, we are people, we are citizens, we are humans. And so when we talk about these issues, we are talking about their impact on people. There is no real world versus um, the virtual world anymore. So this idea that there needs to be a refocus for the future, you mentioned climate change. One of the things that came out of the preparatory session is also a shift in our and how we talk about these issues and how we approach tech, how we approach data from what am I doing with my data to human rights that are always with me no matter what I'm doing. Um, how does technology serve humanity versus just putting up safeguards around the edges? Um, so much to, to delve into there, but I want to turn to Jess now because you, know, you mentioned, uh, Steve mentioned the importance of profitable solutions to corporations. But the fact is, is that many of the solutions we need might not be profitable. Just your research focuses on the design and evaluation of civic technology to support collective action in community networks, ranging from city planning to emergency management. Um, talk to us about what have you seen over the past year, and as you think about some of the key policy questions around the rising awareness of these issues, the risks and opportunities that have emerged from since the pandemic. What are you seeing in the civic tech space? Thanks, Courtney. Um, so I guess I would start off with um, you had raised some um, some interesting, or you had raised transparency. There's um, this is really one of the, the first jumping off points that we can think about when it comes to um, uh, opportunities and um, and ways to garner positive change. And so the first thing that the internet can do is uh, create transparency around certain issues. And so while there certainly are have and have nots and there are um, the people with limited access that are lacking that transparency of those that uh, um, are uh, uh, engaged and active, uh, um, we can start to become more transparent about inequity and uh, social injustice and economic injustice. And so when it comes to inclusion, you know, it all starts with being aware of what the issues actually are and having nuance to those issues before we can uh, um, 
start to take some kind of positive change. And so um, transparency isn't enough, obviously, um, when it comes to uh, all of our decision makers at the policy level. It's also important for them to be, uh, you know, not just for the issue to be transparent, that they um you know, they have access to the information, but also that they become aware of some of the nuance around these issues. And so uh, um, there are certainly policymakers that um, have begun to talk about, uh, um, it, they've begun to talk about uh, the digital divide. They've become to, begun to talk about some of these um, issues in light of uh, the pandemic and um, trying to, uh, engage within a, a digital transformation or trying to make um, more uh, dollars available for infrastructure or for uh, or start to become uh, aware of different policies that that should be made um, based on issues. However, um, at times there uh, there's limitations with this. And so um, there are dollars maybe b being put into certain uh, to bringing uh, internet into areas that didn't have it previously. However, it's uh, um, it's this game of uh, there are some areas that are, you know, they, we have gig gigabit cities coming online, and so simply um, providing internet, um, it it's not going to um, catch up in time because uh, as te new technologies become available, um, we now have certain uh, a certain level of expectation, and so the the game of catching up can be difficult. And so there also needs to be uh, awareness around those those issues before we can get to true engagement um, with trying to address some of the challenges. And so um, having uh, uh, some transparency of, of where there are the most challenges, the nuance around those challenges, starting to uh, have more awareness around um, the best ways to um, tackle things. So what are challenges with the ways that policies have been addressed previously and how can we uh, overcome them? And then starting to engage with uh, new and, and um, diverse opportunities around, uh, you know, addressing previous or, or uh, persistent challenges. Uh, thank you very much, Jess. I think this this focus on transparency that you mentioned does and seem does indeed seem to be one of the developments that we've seen over the past year in terms of really recognizing just how important that is uh, for the accountability and, and ability of these platforms and these services and technologies to serve uh, the public. I want to turn now to Scott Campbell, who you know, is the Senior Human Rights and Technology Officer at the UN uh, Human Rights Commissioner's Office. And let's talk more now about human rights, because we've also seen in the past year uh, revelations about some of the major impacts of technology companies, the fact that um, research that has revealed deep harms to human rights, um, to women and children, uh, health harms, addiction, et cetera, um, and that much of this research is held within companies, but you know, many of us, including your office, have raised concerns about the, Im the negative uh, impact of some of these technologies, both in terms of political discourse, the ability to hold elected officials accountable, um, the role on the public sphere. You have in your office focused on disinformation, among other issues. What are you seeing in terms of the evolution of the policy debate over the past year on this respect, Scott? Well, thanks. Um, thanks very much, Courtney. And, and thanks very much to the other, the other speakers and those involved in the in the prep session, because I think you've made my made my job very easy uh, this morning, and I can I can be pretty pretty brief. I think in my my opening comments, because um, there have been so many good uh, good points made. I'll just try to underscore a few things that that uh, have been just said, and um, and also from the the prep the prep session, and try to build on them a, a little bit. Um, and I think the point just made on transparency is so is so crucial, uh, and so I won't I won't dive into that. But a few other points just to consider when we think about you know why? Why is this debate? Why are these concerns um, becoming so prominent uh, in societal debates? Uh, and and why why is there such increasing um, concern about these issues? And I think Steve, I mean Steve, pointed to one one of the important factors that 
a lot of what we're seeing, you know, the, the types of human rights violations, the types of concerns around human rights we're seeing aren't new, but both COVID and digital technologies impaired, both have been accelerators of existing inequalities, existing discrimination, both within and, and across societies. And I think we've, we've seen more, more of the most vulnerable, the most marginalized being further marginalized. And those that have uh, historically been the most exposed to economic and, and social impact um, of discrimination have also been the most impacted by both COVID-19 and accelerated by the use of, of digital tech in our, in our world. And these same marginalized populations, I think we've seen with COVID-19, have the least capacity to resist and to respond also, as I think, um, as I think Sarah um, spoke to. Um, and secondly, uh, COVID has made many of these existing inequalities just more, more visible, has brought them to the surface in our, in our discussions, in our daily lives. And we see the data on this. That's the other, I think, important factor. We see the data. We see higher death rates among the marginalized and excluded uh, across societies around the globe. Um, we see higher rates of unemployment of those that have had the most difficulty getting and staying uh, employed. Um, so we've, we've, I think that COVID has really just brought a lot of these concerns to the, to the surface. Um, thirdly, uh, and I think what, what is also, maybe it just needs to be underscored, but the, the risks, the human rights risks that we've seen are simply so important. Um, fundamental threats to democracy uh, that we, we've seen in terms of a very important and, and damaging trend over the last, um, last couple of years since the last IGF. Um, less open, less safe less inclusive uh, public digital space, uh, less space in that digital square for debate and expression. So I think just the, the fundamentally grave nature of, of what's happening has also pushed these, these questions to the, to the forefront. Um, maybe I will, um, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. And, and um, I'm, uh, there were so many good points made, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that now and, and look forward to, uh, to the discussion. Over. Thank you so much, Scott. I, I want to invite anyone um, in the room who is interested in, in asking a question of our panelists to raise their hand, and there's a microphone that will go to you. And similarly to our audience online, if you'd like to put a, uh, your hand up in, in uh, the Zoom room, we're going to get to that in a moment. But Scott, before I let you off of the hook, can you get a little bit more detailed on what your office has seen in terms of the major human rights issues that you're focused on um, with respect to your mandate on human rights and technology. Specifically, you know, we talk a lot about freedom of expression, about data privacy, not just data privacy, privacy more generally, uh, disinformation. W please talk, you know, what are the key trends that you guys are focused on, working on right now with this, with this issue? Yeah. No, thanks, Courtney, because it goes right to one of our, our main concerns. I mean, what what we've seen in short is, are really a, is really a whole new range of, of opportunities, if you will, of new entry points for authoritarian regimes. Uh, we've seen new opportunities and new possibilities to curtail uh, public civic space, especially the, the online civic space, and new opportunities to silence voices of dissent and critical voices. Um, and often we've seen you know, what I think are the very legitimate public health concerns, and my own background is in public health and human rights, and, there's some, and our, our high commissioner, of course, is a medical doctor. We both we recognize the, the very legitimate public health concerns of COVID-19 and the need to respond, and in some places, restrict rights to get, uh, to get the, the best response uh, in public interest. However, what we've seen, uh, and a really worrying you know, trend, Courtney, is that many of these legitimate public health concerns are being twisted you know, into methods to exclude people from participation, and especially to include, include people from uh, you know, economic opportunities. Um, there's certainly some you know, restrictions on civil and political rights that, that you mentioned, freedom of movement, freedom of assembly, um, a violation of, of rights to privacy going up. There's been a major concern, the use of apps, uh, in some cases to track people, um, and you know, abuse, abuse of data. Uh, through more uh, invasive um, use of, uh, of technology. I mean, maybe just the last thing, you know, I'll, I'll say in terms of, of concerns, um, there's, there's, a, there's a real risk that, you know, many of these uh, short-term responses to COVID-19 will, that do have damaging impact on human rights, will be made, made permanent. 
And there, yeah, one of the other you know, important trends we've seen that it's very concerning are, are shutdowns. And I think often when we think of internet shutdowns, we're thinking of the impact immediately on access to information, on freedom of expression, and on civil and political rights. But I just I want to just draw attention to the impact on economic opportunities and, and social and economic opportunities. And I think Sarah and Steve both spoke about access to education. And of course, you know, we're, while we're you know, trying as the United Nations to promote connectivity and, and hand in hand with the private sector and build um, you know, build bridges across the digital divide, the increasing trend in shutdowns goes fundamentally against that. Um, and so I think that's, that's a really concerning trend that we've seen uh, the increase over the last year in, uh, in shutdowns. Thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks for highlighting that. And I see a question in the audience, so I'll ask the microphone to go here and just, you know, maybe also contextualize, you know, today, the Committee to Protect Journalists released its annual report on uh, journalists in prison for their work, a record 293, um, again, a, a record. Tomorrow, Maria Ressa and Dmitry Muratov are getting the Nobel Peace Prize, um, both journalists, work, one working in the Philippines, one in Russia, uh, and they're being recognized, you know, because the Nobel Peace Prize Committee uh, recognize that efforts to safeguard freedom of expression is a precondition for democracy and lasting peace. And Maria Ressa is quite well known for her work to expose um, the algorithmic intermediation of the public sphere, specifically in the Philippines, but more broadly how Facebook's algorithm leads to extremism. Um, we've seen revelations about major companies, again, that govern our public sphere, and how the choices about how they design their platforms, which, you know, as Steve notes, are their corporations. So their, uh, you know, raison d'etre is profit. Um, that that has a very pernicious impact on the public sphere, and that seems to have been, uh, you know, made even more clear um, over the past year as new internal research, particularly from Facebook, now known as Meta, has been revealed, um, and that the research can only be done when you, know, you have access to that data, and that kind of picks up on the point that Jess made around transparency, you know, without transparency and, and access to that data, we can't even know what we don't know. Um, before we delve back into that, I want to go here to the audience. Please uh, introduce yourself and ask your question. Thank you very much, Kotlin. This is Ponslate Lilligi from the Gambian IGF. Thank you to all the um, speakers. Um, I just want us um, to get the perspective of the speakers in terms of the um, roadmap on digital co um, cooperation by um, the um, UN, in which um, all the key, eight key action areas are very important. But in terms of ensuring digital inclusion for all, including the most vulnerable, I think if that is not achieved, then all the other eight will fail. So I would like to get um, the perspective of the speakers on how best do you think we can go about within the world community to include to get digital inclusion for all, especially the most vulnerable, which, as Sarah said, um, has really affected a lot of marginalized communities. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I'm also going to um, take another question from the online uh, chat. Amir Mokabari, if you'd like to uh, unmute and briefly ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, everyone, and hello to distinguished panelists uh, and all uh, dear colleagues. Uh, I would like, first of all, I should thank IGF Secretariat and host country for organizing such a well-organized IGF. Uh, and also, I would like to thank you all uh, for convening this time this session. I am Mokabberi, and you Mokabberi from Iranian Academic Community. Uh, I would like to raise a vital issue regarding human rights in digital space. Uh, UCM in cyber war, and I think UCM, unilateral coercive measure in cyber war, and I think it's highly related to the topic of your valuable session. Uh, as you know, more than th uh, three countries are now suffering from this issue. As you all know, the negative effects of unilateral digital sanction on some nations could have 
become intensive and more destructive, especially during COVID-19 pandemic and other emergencies. Uh, this, uh, this digital sanctions on many areas like investment in ICT infrastructure, technology, uh, sanctions on digital services, digital license, uh, licenses, and uh, digital resources like IPs, like uh, DNS system, and access to network are key barrier and obstacle in achieving national development goals using ICT. We believe this digital restrictive measure constitutes human rights violation in cyberspace, especially right to development, right to education, right to business, and so on. Some of uh, our university have problems to access to some scientific database. And some of our digital businesses and Iranian entrepreneurs, digital entrepreneurs, and uh, Iranian applications have been removed from digital stores like Google stores and Apple uh, uh, by pretext of sanctions of their respe respective country. My question is, what would be the role and contribution of the United Nations family and IGF plus community to address this vital issue? Shouldn't there be any norms regarding the prohibition of applying this kind of unjust and illegal digital sanctions against nations in United Nations processes like OEWG or other places. Some countries using that uh, sanctions, digital sanctions, as a pressure tool for achieving their illegitimate goals. Non-discrimination in access to ICT technology and cyber capacity building for all nations could be new norm for having inclusive cyberspace and inclusive internet. I would like to request that our concern will be reflected in final, in final output and final message of IGF 2021 in Katowice, Poland. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, for giving this opportunity to share my concern. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, extensive intervention. Uh, you raised some very interesting points around, you know, I, uh, the cons this is not an in inadvertent, uh, you know, lack of access. This is a um, focus. Sanctions are a choice to deny access um, to certain types of activity, connectivity, access, et cetera, um, which is, of course, an, an interesting dynamic because ultimately that is about um, state-sponsored denial. Um, and of course, we can think about also other aspects of state-sponsored human rights abuses, including denial of internet, shut, uh, denial of inter internet services, net shutdowns, uh, and of course, um, restrictions on people's ability to freely express themselves online and offline. Uh, so I want to go to our panelists to address these two questions, one around digital inclusion, especially for the most vulnerable, and this question, uh, if you can, you can address the, the question around sanctions and whether there should, this should be addressed in this framework, but I also want to pull out another uh, aspect, which was the role of the IGF, and that is one of our key policy questions. What is the role of the IGF? to promote these rights. So um, can I please ask for the panelists to address these two questions, starting with Sarah. Um, thank you for the questions that you have raised. Um, if I may start with the providing basic services, basically, I think I'll use the example of uh, education again. So it goes like there's so many pieces that have to fit together for this to work. It goes beyond just, for example, even if you have good back, uh, national backbone infrastructure, you have access to good internet services, maybe they're even affordable. There are many other things that fit into the piece. For example, do your uh, educators actually have the right skills to be able to engage with the learners in a way that they can use digital tools to support the learning? Uh, and this, like this basically for, I, I think in many countries, especially in developing countries, you so you have to upskill as you have to learn and relearn uh, things. There are just so many things that fit together. But if I may 
talk about shutdowns, I'll use uh, what Jess was saying earlier about awareness. Uh, in most cases, it's governments who do these shutdowns. And in Uganda, we experienced a shutdown earlier this year, which was just uh, really crazy. It was a total internet shutdown. Everyone was cut down. And it's it's something we have to continuously advocate, let the governments know that these are the dangers. So it's not just that you're cutting people off from services, you're also affecting the network because even when services were brought back, there are some things which are inaccessible. Until now, you still can't access Facebook. Uh, some people still struggle to access uh, GitHub. So it, it's just a conversation we have to continue having with governments and letting them know uh, creating awareness and telling them about the dangers of some of these things. So, yeah, and I think we are just getting started. I don't think it's something that we can solve like in one day. Uh, that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, Scott, I want to go to you about this question around, you know, sanctions uh, as, as an aspect of this, but also, you know, the role of the IGF and, and how we see the IGF playing uh, in terms of human rights violations. No, thanks, Gordon. And, and um, if I can also just pick up on the, I think the excellent uh, question posed by the um, the speaker from the Gambia um, IGF, because I, I think you know he 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 just underscores you know how important um, inclusion you know of the most vulnerable is, and and what can we do about that? What are the approaches? And I think it's just um, for for me, what strikes me is how important. Um, human rights due diligence and conducting human rights impact assessments, uh, how important that is to avoiding or to mitigating um, the risks of inclusion being enhanced by the use of, of digital technology. And here I think there's a role both for companies, um, as, as Steve is, is well aware, and for states, right? And I think it's both that need to be thinking uh, much more um, more than thinking, but in embedding in their processes, in their design of, of tech products, in their development, the rollout of tech products, in the monitoring of use of, of digital tech, assessing the, the impact um, of those products uh, on human rights and the full range of, of human rights. Um, but in particular, I think, you know, back to the question, how are these, how is the use, the development, the use of these tech products going to either favor uh, or disfavor inclusion? inclusion of the most the most marginalized but I, I think that will go that approach having a human rights based approach and applying human rights due diligence I think that'll take us a long way to um, addressing some of the concerns that that were raised and and in, you know, and, and starting to address the um, the problems of uh, uh, of exclusion and then very very quickly and hopefully we can come back to this in the future because there's a lot there's a lot to say about the role of the IGF I think uh, and and what's going on in this uh, in this space there's so much going on in, in the governance space, um, a lot by states, uh, massive efforts around the world to regulate the online space. I think in the last um, couple of years, we've seen more than 40 new social media laws. Um, there are several dozen under consideration you know, as, we, as we speak. And a lot of these governance frameworks, uh, new legislation, um, put human rights at risk. Uh, and there's a lot of risk also of, of fragmenting the online space. So there's a lot of work to, to be done there. And I think the IGF just has a critical role to play, both as, as convener and as helping to set the compass you know, to guide um, the development of these, uh, of these different governance frameworks. And I think ultimately the IGF uh, is, you know, is a form that can push towards making the digital space more diverse, more accessible um, and open and, and, and safer for, for all. And I think, um, you know, as, as Steve and others were saying, you know, putting human rights um, having a human-centric, human rights-based approach, I think, can take us a, a good way down that road. Over. Okay. Thank, thank you for that. Can I get my mic back? Hello? Can I have my mic? Hi. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I want to go to Steve because you are uh, a company. You've mentioned the importance of inclusion. It's really hard to include people who are under sanctions. How do you think about sanctions as a human rights issue, as a violation, as... Uh, you obviously have to comply um, as a U.S.-based company, but also what is, you know, how do we think about these different roles of, of states when it is, it's not just about they don't have access to, they are being denied access by other countries? All right, well, fascinating question. Happy to engage. Of course, I'm not giving a Microsoft perspective here. It's not something where we 
and said, here's our policy on that. So these will be my reflections on it based upon decades working inside Microsoft and um, more than a decade on these very issues. Um, first is, you know, there is such a thing as international law. Uh, there, there is such a thing as state-to-state uh, -state diplomacy. There's the United Nations. And um, one of the things states try to do is influence one another. And at some stage, it's not the role of companies to be uh, making those decisions. We're not above the law. We don't make the law. We're, we're actually, if we, as we do at Microsoft, we believe in rule of law. We're subject to laws. Now, that doesn't mean we don't lobby for positions and urge um, what we think are better and worse solutions to challenges, uh, especially in the United States where we're based. So a lot of work lobbying the U.S. Congress, but it's a little more attenuated when it gets into uh, a you know, a U.S. company telling a foreign uh, government and its people what they need to do uh, based upon our precision as a private company. But within that, I would say that um, we have a bias for engagement. We are You're not going to find Microsoft saying we wish there were more uh, boycotts of uh, governments and people. Our mission is to empower every person on the planet to achieve more. And we take that literally that it means every person on the planet. It doesn't matter where you were born, uh, the current uh, challenges you might be facing with human rights today. If there's a way for us to engage responsibly, we seek to do that. Uh, but I, I really can't provide an, an answer and a solution uh, of the sort that I think that uh, the questioner was asking about, other than to say, we do believe dialogue and engagement is far better and far more responsible uh, than uh, taking a position we ought to avoid those who are uh, presenting challenges. Um, but within that, it has to happen inside the international governance uh, uh, environment. And the United Nations has a, a significant uh, place uh, role in that. Um, I will say, uh, just as we seek to engage and we want more inclusion, we, you might know, are very active in combating um, cyber attacks, whether nation state or private, on the internet infrastructure. And so there are uh, lots of reports we put out. We put out one again this week on uh, some major actors who are out there actively looking to uh, interfere with the uh, operation of the internet. I, my final comment will be that on this issue of uh, boycotts and uh, denials of services, there's a tension in that. And um, Scott knows this from our many discussions on human rights uh, around the United Nations of rights are typically in tension. I, I never want to say they conflict, but they are in tension. You don't have an absolute right to privacy, uh, whether in the Un Universal Declaration or in the ICPR. Your right is to uh, be free from arbitrary and unlawful interference with it. But there are boundaries to most of these things. And the goal is always to maximize the benefits. And that's one of the challenges and one of the things that UN guiding principles push companies to do is how do you make sure you understand the various potential harms as well as the good things you're trying to achieve and then develop a responsible, um, and I will pick up on that notion that's come up. I think we'll need to talk more about it, transparency, actually talking about these things and making the trade-offs and the considerations, um, the factors that went into a decision more transparent is going to lead to better decisions, uh, just not just in the industry, but across the globe. I'll stop there. Uh, great, thank you for, for that, Steve. Um, more transparency is, I think, indeed helpful. You know, in addition to issues around sanctions, and I acknowledge, Amir, we have attempted to get answers to your questions. I can't do much more um, to make anyone respond, but you know, we also see how technology is being used, for example, social media technology in conflicts where you have the overthrow of democratically elected governments, for example, in Afghanistan, in, in Myanmar, um, in several places around the world. And there is, I think, an, tech companies don't necessarily even know where their technologies are going to be used and don't have clear policies on whether, for example, sanctions regimes apply to some of these internet service platforms. So it is a very interesting issue, but I do want to move us on. We have a question in the audience that I'm going to go to and then take two in the chat. Hello. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, thank, uh, good morning to all. This is uh, Biju Fernandez, and I represent uh, Jamraj Technologies, which is a UK-based company from the corporate side. Uh, now, uh, my question is that uh, from the corporates, we do a lot of work around uh, corporate social responsibility, but uh, how can IGF help uh, uh, companies like us so that we can go back to the communities and uh, help people and uh, uh, look at, because we do a lot of work around the educational sector. So is, is there a platform where companies, uh, it, we, are, we are not large as Microsoft, but we are medium-sized companies. We also want to participate actively in this uh, uh, forum. So is there a way that IGF could help uh, companies like us or uh, partner with companies like us so that we can go back to the communities and uh, uh, do uh, uh, corporate social responsibility kind of activities uh, uh, from that side of, uh, so just needed your thoughts on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that important question about how to engage with the business community and, and you know, I would say all of these stakeholder communities that are of different sizes and capacities. So thank you for that. Um, I also want to bring in two questions from the chat that were written in full. One from um, Evelyn Tauschnitz, who is asking a question to Scott about whether the COVID pandemic worsened the issue of government surveillance or just made it more visible and a topic of political discourse. And I do want to note that the issue of surveillance came up as a significant concern, a, a limiting factor to some of the beneficial uses of technology and access. And so I would like our panelists to um, you know, delve into this a bit more and how do we protect human rights and ensure uh, human rights uh, and compliant and centered access and inclusion uh, in light of both state-sponsored mass surveillance, private corporate mass surveillance, and of course the, the targeted advertising that is the basis of so much of our public sphere. Um, but before I turn to you, I also want to bring in a question from Jesse Nathan Kalange online, who says, um, if you don't mind, okay, sorry, just kidding. Uh, I'm gonna go first then to Jess on, on this question. And if we can talk about surveillance, you work in civic tech, um, public interest, but how are we, how, how does surveillance figure in and how can we ensure that as we broaden and, and improve access and inclusivity that we're not also embedding the potential for surveillance into that? Challenge. <laughs> uh, um, so that's a great question. So some of the things that I work with um, deal with crisis response. And so when it comes to um, trying to get help during an emergency, uh, at times we can say, I will give the government all of my information. I will, um, I would like the, you know, people to know where I am, what my situation is and uh, how to best deliver um, emergency response. However, the other side of that is um, how do you only make something available during that emergency situation and not at other times? Uh, um, so it, it's a balance. There's, a, um, there's also situations where um, we are, uh, when phone lines are down, um, people are turning to social media in order to post the fact that they might need help during the crisis. And emergency, emergency response doesn't necessarily uh, have a good way to see and respond to those issues methodically. And so um, some of this is, is coming up with human-centered approaches. Some of it is a lot of need-finding work to understand um, you know, what is what is happening when somebody is in need, and then um, what is it that uh, that groups that can uh, provide response, uh, um, how can we deliver information to them while also uh, preserving the privacy uh, of individuals? And so, um, especially when it comes to those uh, social media situations, uh, um, when you're in crisis and you're, you're posting, um, there's, you're wanting the attention perhaps of a, um, a government or a civic entity and uh, um, what you're really getting the attention of is perhaps uh, um, somebody who's able to market something to you based on your location, your uh, um, the words and context that you're using. And so we're, we're already giving up a lot. Uh, um, and so how can we, uh, um, 
how can we balance that um, in in a in an appropriate way is a, is is a challenge. And so, um, we do need people thinking about this from a, a research perspective. Um, we have to make sure that it's not only industry coming to the table, um, because uh, there might be. Um, it, you know, uh, just a certain, um, they, they'll have their own um, or profit-based perspectives and that's uh, appropriate, um, but there needs to also be government and other uh, more neutral research uh, parties uh, um, thinking about these issues. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, I'd like to turn now to, to Sarah. How are you thinking about these issues in the communities that you work with, and, and what are you seeing as the risks um, posed by surveillance? Um, actually, I wanted to respond to it in a different way because uh, there are things we can do to make our voices heard in terms of surveillance. And I think I would like to call this acts of resistance. If I can give an example of earlier at the start of the year when WhatsApp uh, sent out these notifications on our phones telling us uh, how if by a certain date we didn't accept the terms, uh, somehow we, I think by default, by a particular day, we would uh, uh, be moved and uh, start sharing our data. And I just remember people started moving to Signal and Telegram and even people who didn't know about Signal or Telegram. Uh, my mom moved to Signal and to this day she calls me using Signal. And I don't think she knows much about the difference, but she just knows everyone was moving. So these acts of resistance can actually make our voices heard. Um, simple things like if, if everyone decides that we're going to just cover our cameras on our laptops, much as um, it may not be impactful, but if everyone is doing it, then the the companies maybe can start to think about something. I think that's what I would say about the surveillance thing. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, let me turn now to Scott. You know, how is does the Office um, of the High Commissioner look at this? And, you know, we know that there have been several reports by special rapporteurs looking at various dimensions of surveillance, but, you know, there is this whole new factor with COVID tracing apps and the pandemic. Talk to us about this. Yeah, no, and thanks for the, the, the question. And, I mean, our, in short, our office views all of this with, with uh, the, the utmost concern. I think it's, it's a great, you know, the question posed is, has um, surveillance um, been made more visible or, or uh, been more, more visible by the COVID-19 pandemic, or is it actually getting worse? And I, I think the answer is, uh, is it's, it's an either or, it's, it's an and. It's, it's certainly, we've seen both um, a rapid, rapid growth um, in the use of surveillance technologies and, you know, COVID-19 bringing all of that to, um, to, the, to the surface. Um, these aren't, you know, these aren't, uh, it's, surveillance is not new, I think, and we've, you know, we've said that a few times uh, during the discussion this morning, but um, we have seen just such growth and increased vis visibility around, around it. Um, our office has been um, extremely concerned. We've, we've published a number of reports. We, we put one out uh, just in September on uh, artificial intelligence and, and the right to privacy. Um, and have been speaking out um, pretty regularly about um, some of the um, you know more contentious issues of the day, um, the use of um, uh, of the Pegasus uh, app to uh, increase uh, surveillance and tracking. Um, the High Commissioner has called uh, the High Commissioner for Human Rights has called for uh, a ban on artificial intelligence intelligence applications that cannot be used in compliance with international human rights. Um, she's also called for a moratorium on, on the sale of different types of surveillance technology until and including facial recognition technology until safeguards can be put in place, until companies and states have, have done their due diligence, done their homework to make sure that this technology will not be used to, to harm human rights. And I think um, in, in responding you know, to some of the challenges there, it's important to note just that you know, we're not starting from, from scratch. Um, and both companies and businesses have guiding principles from the United Nations on, on business and human rights. And these can provide a, a, a framework for developing products, developing services, developing policies um, that will, you know, will assist them in, in meeting their, their human rights responsibilities. And I think you know, central to that is um, companies and states and, and, and governments um, using human rights due diligence 
when they're thinking about either legislation on how to how to regulate um, this uh, this sector and and, and specifically uh, surveillance technology, uh, and for the companies when they're doing the actual development themselves, that they're looking at the potential human rights harms, the potential human rights impact of what they're developing, and take all measures to identify those risks, um, try to mitigate them or prevent them where possible, and make sure that they've baked in some kind of remedy for the when the for abuse of, of products or when things do go wrong and, and people are victims of violations. Over. Thank you, Scott. Um, interesting points, I think. Two I want to draw out are, you know, these are guiding principles. Um, they are not regulatory requirements or legally binding treaties. And so, you know, this idea that um, companies need to mitigate and prevent abuses is also predicated on the idea that the technology is not inherently uh, human rights abusing. So you mentioned, for example, the calls for a uh, moratorium on the use of facial recognition, I would say also biometric and biometric um, and sentiment analysis. And we've seen that the COVID-19 pandemic has provided cover for the rollout of many of these types of pervasive surveillance um, you know, systems as have national security issues, but kind of the combination of those, for example, at borders where you see pervasive facial and biometric analysis, no one knows what's happening with that data. What is the oversight of that? How is that used? Um, and I, I want to come to Steve because we saw that Google and, and uh, Facebook, sorry, Google and Apple um, tried to implement a COVID tracking uh, approach that could be used by governments in coordination with their apps, but they asserted it was privacy protecting. I think you saw very little uptake of that because there is very little trust um, in the companies um, and in any sort of uh, rhetorical promises made by those companies. So could you talk to us about this trust deficit? and how that links to these critical issues around human rights, around surveillance, and ultimately that is linked to this issue of access and wider inclusion. Um, how are you grappling with that as a company and trying to mitigate the trust deficit? Right, <clears throat> a great set of questions. Um, I'll start by saying, my sense, and I was not deeply involved in, in any of this, Microsoft developed similarly an app in collaboration with the university. Um, my sense, the uptake of the COVID apps that, for example, Apple and Google had, was less about distrust of the companies than governments actually wanting uh, more control. It wasn't, wasn't so much the trust issue, which I think is a real issue of, do we trust uh, companies with the data they collect and uh, how they store it, uh, what additional uses it's put to, um, and whether, uh, I, I'll actually shift right away to this notion of use. My perspective, and this is generally the way you'll find Microsoft uh, speaking on these issues, is we strongly believe in regulation of uses. It, it actually goes back to the way I started my comments uh, at the beginning of the uh, session, which is almost a social contract. We genuinely believe that good regulation is exactly what all of us want. Uh, but good regulation, this builds on Scott's notion of um, due diligence, is deeply informed regulation about benefits and harms, understanding the technology, understanding how it can be misused, and regulating that, not leaving it. The UNGPs, it's, it's not a weakness that they're not binding. It's, it's actually the very nature of them. These were to be voluntary activities that companies undertook in the absence of regulation to address these human rights harms. Um, so I, I view them as a, a very strong positive in the way uh, certainly the technology sector has evolved over the last decade. Um, but one of the things that I think is out there is it's not so much um, in the COVID space that we don't trust the companies. I think that governments wanted more access to the data to do more things with it. There might be epidemiology sorts of studies that people want to do that would be very difficult if, if it had to go through the companies. And that was a place where um, I think, you know, we, we have informed decisions. On the broader question of surveillance, um, 
I think what we've witnessed over the last decades, it, it's, it's not just during COVID, but what we lost wasn't the idea of um, secrecy when we're out in public. It was actually this notion of uh, what some academics refer to as anonymity. There used to be practical anonymity. I knew if I was walking in a public square, somebody might take a photograph of me and I didn't have any violation of my privacy, but I was still anonymous. It wasn't identified to me, the unique human being with all of the characteristics and all of the things that somebody could learn about me. It was just, there was a picture of a random person walking in a square. And what this uh, modern broad surveillance with the, the richest, most powerful use of technologies has done is destroyed that confidence that we can actually be anonymous when we're in public, or it has done this uh, disservice, I think, to um, many of us. Uh, for example, I don't operate on any of the social networks out of privacy concerns, um, because I, I actually do think that there's value in sharing what I want to share with the people uh, that I choose to share it with, rather than having it uh, be collected, uh, just vacuumed up, and then uh, used for reasons I have no, for purposes I have no control over. So I, I think you'll find that uh, many of us are in favor of informed, deeply informed, technically uh, uh, credible discussion of particular uses. And that is where I think we ought to be focusing attention rather than thinking that we're going to stop um, countries across the globe uh, who have desire to uh, use these technologies, stop all of their development. I don't think it's uh, a net benefit to have only the worst actors developing the most powerful technologies. Thank you for that, Steve. And that is the perfect transition to kind of the second portion of this this uh, important issue, which is possible governance strategies. And some of the key, key issues that came up in the preparatory session, and which has been really, we want to delve in into um, as we kind of get into the last half an hour here, is governance strategies. Because governments are accountable that human rights are respective, and the private sector has a role, but it is fundamentally the role of states and governments. And that there is a consensus um, that governments need to be inclusive, and that there should be some international coordination with shared ideas for society to fight injustices and human rights abuses. And I want to draw on a question from the chat as we talk about this idea of inclusiveness, because there's a question in here uh, about whether uh, I internally displaced people um, and, and how, so I'm trying to find the question, um, the, how people who are displaced by conflicts in their own country can also have access to ICT and the internet. So another another element of inclusivity. But in addition, um, one of the things that came out of the preparatory phase is this idea of needing an internationally legally binding instrument on the use of the internet and digital technologies and data in accordance with already existing human rights frameworks. I think partly because there are only guiding principles and commitments and soft non-binding law. Um, so I definitely want to get the panelists to respond to whether you agree with this idea and what your thoughts about a legally binding agreement are. But I want to raise a few of the other um, issues that came up from the preparatory phase, which are the obstacles to anything that has to do with uh, coordination and regulation globally is the national security issues and market competition among private companies. So obviously national security being primary for many states um, and how an international framework could even work given those, those two kind of primary focus uh, by both governments and private companies. And that governance should be multi-stakeholder and representative. So, you know, that is very tough when you're talking about how to do an international treaty, when you're talking about national security, when you're talking about, um, you know, market competition. How do we make sure that there is multi-stakeholderism and representativeness, that simply having stakeholders is not sufficient. Um, there needs to be representative in the stakeholder groups. 
There was also this focus on, um, as, we've, as we've alluded to and, and touched on in the discussion already, that data governance needs to respect human rights. And again, centering human rights within the person and no matter what they're doing online or how they're interacting with digital technologies to be a shift to center that and thinking therefore about responsible technology. Is that a promising framework? Uh, for thinking about how we can ensure that uh, the most vulnerable online and offline are protected, that this is in accordance with human rights, and that as digital inclusion proceeds, uh, that there is a responsible technology perspective embedded at the center of that. So I want to turn now to our panelists to address that, uh, those questions. You can pick those and then we will go to a round of questions online and in the room, so please prepare those. So first off, I'm gonna to go to you, Scott. Thanks, Courtney. Um, there's there's an awful lot to, <laughs> to chew on there, but I think I uh, maybe I'll, I'll start off just by um, picking up on the, the last points that were made, I think, about um, the trust, trust deficit um, and linking that with transparency and accountability. Um, I think the question raised, you know, about the, um, uh, the Google and Apple um, efforts uh, to develop um, a COVID tracing app, I think it reflects both you know, a, a lack of trust in, in the companies, but also a, a broader lack uh, of trust in, in governments uh, around the globe and decreasing confidence, I think, in, in governments. What can be useful here, I think, in building that trust are applying the, the human rights principles that, that you know, we've mentioned several times now, but in particular, increasing transparency, um, transparency in algorithmic uh, development, in, in product development, um, in how policies are, are being applied, rules, company rules being applied. I think increasing transparency can take us a long way there, and then accountability uh, as well, uh, and making sure that when things do go wrong, um, that uh, people are, are held, held to account. On the, you know, the binding treaty question and um, trying to, you know, further develop uh, the international standards and norms. I think, um, I mean, just to just to note, um, you know, as you said, Courtney, the, the UN guiding principles uh, on business and human rights are are just that. They're principles. They're guiding principles. They're they're not binding. Um, there is a, a an effort over the last several years uh, among member states and civil society to transform those guiding principles into a binding international treaty. We see a lot of, a lot of resistance there, and, and Courtney, you actually underscored, I think, some of the, the, the underlying factors as to why there, there, there is resistance to making those um, more, uh, more binding. Um, and I, I guess I would just point in general to, um, you know, the, as, as efforts are made to increase regulation, um, there's just, there's, there's a, a risk that, we actually move backwards in terms of the inclusivity front uh, and, not, and not forward. And I think the IGF you know, has a very important role to play there by, by bringing people together, creating a multi-stakeholder um, uh, setting where responses can be developed and people can ask questions. Well, how can I, you know, where can I find tools and resources um, about applying a human rights-based approach or integrating human rights into, our, uh, into the, way, the way we're doing business? Um, the objective, I think, is, of course, to make the digital space you know, more diverse, more accessible, more inclusive. I, mean, that, I think that's you know, generally what we're, we're looking for. And, and putting human rights at the, the center uh, of those conversations, I think, is, um, is you know, again, is just is, is crucial. Um, I think you know, badly developed regulation, as, you know, as Steve and others have said, I think getting the regulation right is just so important uh, in terms of consolidating um, democracy. Uh, and I, I think, you know, on the other hand, poorly developed regulation uh, may help us to consolidate, you know, deeply undemocratic and discriminatory approaches and work against uh, inclusion. And again, I think the IGF just has a really important, you know, role there as we're seeing today by bringing in different voices into the, into the conversation. Um, but I'll finish just on underscoring, underscoring again, the importance of um, transparency uh, and accountability um, in decision making, and, and that needs to be both, you know, at the company level and the, the state level, and that public participation, you know, in these discussions is just is so fundamental. Um, thanks. Thank you for that. Um, 
who else from our panel would like to jump in on this? Please just go ahead and unmute. Jess, did you want to, I see you smiling, do you want to jump in on this? On whether, you know, does a legally binding treaty hold promise? And I'm going to come to Steve, but I'd like to hear, you know, from Sarah or Jess from the kind of civil society perspective, and especially, you know, Mozilla is a nonprofit organization that has different types of implications. Um, and what do you think? Does this hold promise? Is this the right direction? It does seem like a step in the right direction. Um, it, it does also seem important to have many of these multi-stakeholder meetings, though, and uh, um, understand uh, where everyone is coming from when they talk about these issues. It, it's uh, uh, too often the case where uh, um, when, it, when it comes to certain types of issues, uh, we can all be having a discussion about a topic, but uh, um, we all, we're not necessarily um, on the same topic because these are these are such uh, big issues. And so everyone, um, especially when it comes to um, policy, everyone has their uh, an agenda um, that's associated with that. And so um, there's, um, it, it seems like we're, we're just getting to this space. And so there's gonna be um, a lot of different uh, you know, sub plans or sub agendas within that. Excellent point. Uh, and Sarah, what do you think? Yes, I agree with Jess and Scott that uh, this is not something you can leave to one company or one group of people. Otherwise, they'll just self-govern, and that means that they pick the route that's easiest to them. And of course, there are groups that are already doing international standards and things like that, so we could use the, the same routes. Though I wanted to just add and say that uh, we have to go beyond uh, like a multi-stakeholder approach, so we, we do that through the IGF, but outside of that, um, I think Steve earlier talked about human-centered approach, uh, where the core design approaches to designing of technologies, and we actually have a very big opportunity to leverage on skills that our communities have. So you have like, uh, in my work there, I work with uh, artists and uh, uh, local technicians and creatives and people like that. So working with them to help, for them to help deploy technology. And this means that then you have technology that's inclusive, it's bottom up, and it's also relevant for local context. Yeah. That Thank you. That, that's an excellent point. I think using that terminology around co-design is an is a interesting way to think about this. I'm going to skip, Steve, because I feel like we did hear from you that you want uh, legally binding resolutions because we only have a few minutes left. We have two hands in the audience, so I'm going to ask the mic to go down here while I incorporate a, a question from the Madagascar Hub around whether artificial intelligence plays a significant role in human rights and does it help protect or infringe them in a certain way. So what I'm hearing in this question is like, let's hear about a little bit about specifics. And before I turn that uh, to the panel, and I'm gonna maybe call on Steve for that, uh, to get into some specifics about how you think about human rights with artificial intelligence, both the pros and cons. I wanna go here into the audience. Please introduce yourself and keep your question brief. Raja Asif Mahmood from Pakistan. As um, arrival of the COVID-19, use of internet become more necessary and even third world countries were, uh, I will say, forced to use the internet and bring this facility for their education system and for working from home, etc. And during this period, we have noticed that cyber crime has enhanced to a great level as well, as these countries and societies were not well acquainted uh, with the internet facilities and new to these, uh, this system. And the cyber criminal is performing on transnational level, but the, the communities are not um, performing uh, at such level. And their governments are even not able to get the data and specific evidence from the uh, different social media providers when it is needed to fight the crime. And what is the, uh, what are the suggestions with the IGF and our panelists uh, to, uh, on this aspect? Thank you. Uh, we had one other question uh, in the room. 
back here. And as uh, the mic is going back there, I just want to remind uh, the panelists that there is a question about responsible technology and whether it makes sense to be talking about um, that uh, as a specific dimension. Um, and now we're back here in the room, please. Hello, my name is Kamil Parkitne from Five uh, High School in Częstochowa. Uh, I want to ask a question, it's a really simple question. It's uh, in our in era of pandemic, we have to wear a mask at school, at work, at everywhere else. And the teachers both ask, asks to that we have to put them on. And uh, the teacher, the students, really often uh, says that they are uh, they don't respect their rights. Are they right or are they not? Um, okay, thanks for that. That's not really an internet governance question, but we'll see if any of the panelists want to address that. Thank you, though, for attending uh, the Internet Governance Forum. It's really great to see high school students here. Um, I want to now go back to our panel. We have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to ask for your concluding remarks, but specifically, if you can address um, the relevant questions that were asked in the room, specifically, you know, including in the chat around whether there needs to be more hard law rather than just soft law around surveillance, around cybercrime, uh, around human rights protections. And we have five minutes left, so I do want to get you on the record around this. I think this is really important for helping us um, move forward with what comes out of the Internet Governance Forum. And I'm gonna to turn to Steve first, and also in addition to answering those questions, if you could briefly describe the, the human rights benefits and challenges of artificial intelligence. Okay. Well, we, we only have 10 minutes and we have <laughs> other panelists, so very briefly. <clears throat> um, I wanna take up first a question about responsible technology. Um, that's at the core of what we do at Microsoft. We have a, we have a group, the Office of Responsible AI, um, a, a good friend, colleague of mine, um, runs that, and uh, she is her technical, her formal title is our uh, Chief Responsible AI Officer for the company. So this notion of responsibility is at the core of taking seriously human rights and human-centered design. Just this morning, I was in a meeting that was, uh, you know, it was, uh, it would be probably, I, I would imagine without exaggerating, it was dozens of people. And what we do in these uh, review sessions, such as the one we had, a particular technology that's being developed out of Microsoft research being uh, then adopted and adapted by a product group looking at, here's a new service we could provide. And we go through a deep challenge of the, the potential human rights issues related to it. And anytime you're dealing with machine learning, questions of bias and fairness come in. Uh, but also there's, is, is, it, is this really something that uh, enhances and empowers people or is it something that we can do? And simply the fact that we can do it doesn't mean we should do. So we, we have those discussions inside the company and I think other major companies do that as well. One of the challenges I think frankly is at the smaller level, at the startup level, you don't have the luxury of having the ability to gather people and have those internal discussions. So we have, you know, academics who are on the payroll to help drive and, and focus uh, these academic discussions of fairness and bias in artificial intelligence, deeply informed computer scientists who are working with our researchers to make sure that we're getting the most uh, valuable kinds of uh, perspectives on that with deep understanding of the technology as it is and where it's developing. Um, my then I will very briefly, knowing we only have a couple of minutes, I'll just say on the notion of um, a binding instrument, if you look at the way the UN operates, we're very strong supporters of the United Nations. Um, I happen to sit in an office that the umbrella is actually the United Nations and international organiz organizations, even though I'm our human rights uh, lead. And so we do believe in that process. I don't know though, uh, speaking personally, not as a Microsoft statement, that we think we would end up with a better statement of human rights than we have in the Universal Declaration, the International Covenant, if we sat down and said, we're gonna start from scratch today and um, every country, including those who have the uh, least demonstrated respect for the existing human rights regime, 
are going to draft the new binding rules for us. So I actually am personally in favor of um, breathing more life and more meaning into the existing instruments and using the UN as a means of driving that improvement of the human rights situation rather than saying, let's start over and do it fresh. Um, we do favor, as I said, real regulation, binding regulation that's deeply informed. If we don't enjoy and it's, it's a distraction of resources to figure out what to do when we have clear guidance from democratically um, uh, instituted regulations that we can, we can follow and we know that it is actually addressing the desires of people who were heard through their representatives. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Steve. I know a lot to address in just the final moments of concluding remarks. Um, Sarah, I want to turn to you and also ask you if you could address the question about um, artificial intelligence and human rights because you have done such um, important work on gender and AI along with the other questions. Please go ahead. Okay, um, thank you. So let me just start by mentioning something that Mozilla has been doing for a while and they're calling it trustworthy artificial intelligence. So I would put them in the same uh, responsible technology, uh, trustworthy AI. And basically uh, what Mozilla is trying to do is move towards artificial intelligence that's helpful rather than harmful to human beings. Um, there are so many aspects of that. So the steps include privacy, fairness, trust, safety, transparency. So uh, basically shifting the conversation from personal behavior, asking users, uh, you should hide this, you should do this and that on your phones, to asking for systemic change from, from companies. And by doing this, also trying to hold companies accountable for what they are doing. So there are some projects like there's a YouTube uh, regrets campaign and many other campaigns where uh, uh, Mozilla has actually held some companies to account. There's one by uh, Venmo. I, I don't know if many of you know at some point Venmo data was public by default, but now uh, advocacy through Mozilla, uh, they managed to change that and now it's no longer public by default. So now uh, talking about the work we did uh, about three or four years ago with the Research ICT Africa, and it was funded by Microsoft. Thank you very much. So basically, we uh, did a landscape study trying to understand gender and artificial intelligence in the African continent, uh, looking at who is in the space, uh, which countries have policies in relation to AI. Uh, we even went a uh, notch further and looked at who is actually coming into computer science or uh, computing degrees and things like that. I can share the link to the study if anyone is interested, but it was very interesting to, to see that uh, some of these biases happen because like, for example, in terms of gender, there are not even many people on the table. And as many of the panelists have already said, if you have like just a particular group making decisions on behalf of everyone, then the technology will not be inclusive. I think that's what I'll say. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sarah, and uh, excellent points and, and this idea of transitioning from focus from a focus on personal behavior to the broader uh, context would you know be one thing that could be helpful by uh, an international legally binding treaty, but I'll also note that there is a comment to the fact that you know there are existing legally binding treaties on human rights and kind of as Steve alluded to. Um, Jess, coming to you on this final round of questions and concluding remarks, your thoughts? We may have lost Jess. My apologies, oh, my internet okay. connection has become unstable. Uh, um, I uh, just want to thank everyone uh, for the great comments and the, um, uh, I've learned a lot through this uh, uh, session and uh, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass my, my remarks on to somebody else. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, the, the issue of access and connectivity live and in person. Um, then Scott, we're gonna transition to you for final remarks on these you know, <laughs> vast array of questions, but really if you could talk to us about your thoughts on responsible tech, on this idea of legally binding treaty. Do we need a new one or are the existing ones enough? Sure, and I'll, I'll be I'll be brief as I realize we're just about out of time. We may lose our uh, interpreters um, and and become less inclusive. So I'll I'll really be quick and just make uh, three three very quick points. But I think that the issue of artificial intelligence uh, as being both you know an enhancer and a pot potential threat to human rights is just is is fundamental here. 
Um, and with, you know, the Secretary General last year put out a report on how artificial intelligence can take us forward in, in meeting the SDGs and enhancing social and economic rights, and at the same time pointing out the risks um, they're, they're in. And I think that's, you know, that's the key. It, it's using a, a human rights lens so we can mitigate the harms, of, the potential harms of artificial intelligence and fully benefit um, the, um, the power of AI in pushing us forward towards, uh, towards the SDGs. Um, on a binding international instruments, um, legislation, regulation, I think the answer, you know, in, in short is a yes with a comma, but, you know, yes, we do need more rules. We need hard and binding rules out there um, to regulate this space. But the comma and the but is, but getting it right is so important. And I think, you know, in January, there, there will be um, international um, discussions to develop a new, treme, a new treaty on cybercrime, for example, to address the very serious issues of cybercrime and that have been, been highlighted by some of the, the questioners earlier. But getting that treaty, treaty right will be so important. And the room and possibility of moving backwards on human rights through the development of the international binding treaties that are not you know, carefully, carefully crafted, I think is, is very real. And, and again, I think participation and transparency um, in the development of, of new governance frameworks, be they national, be they international, is just so important. Um, and lastly, on responsible tech, I think it, it, it is very useful um, to call upon companies to live up to their responsibilities, of course, in the use of, of technology. So I think that that's helpful. I would just, I, I think it's important to go a little further though, or, or to clarify, as I think Steve was starting to do, that when we're talking about responsibility, you know, what does that really mean? And how are we defining, well, what is responsible or what is ethical or what is human centric even? And there again, I think um, human rights can give us a framework that is, uh, is very clear, um, is legally binding, crosses borders, reflects you know, universal values of the, the, the UDHR. Um, but I think it's important to push us to go a little further um, and, and define what do we mean by, by responsible, responsible behavior and, and putting human rights at the, at the forefront there. Um, thanks very much. Thank you so much for those really thoughtful uh, comments from all of the panelists and for the audience who have participated online and off, uh, both in person here in Poland and around the world, including our panelists from the Western Hemisphere who are literally getting up in the middle of the night to be part of this discussion because it is so fundamental to internet governance, to the Internet Governance Forum, and of course we are on the eve of Human Rights Day, so there really is no better day to have this discussion. We will be putting together a report. We have a lot to think about and to digest out of this conversation. We hit on a lot of topics and have seen just in how incredibly diverse, complex, and interconnected issues of economic and social inclusion and human rights are. So I want to thank you for a really fascinating, thought-provoking session and encourage you to keep engaged um, over the next year as we bring these policy considerations forward. Thank you so much.